Hey, I'd like to start off by thanking Amit Melanoma and uh, um, Omid for inviting me here. I think this is a great opportunity, and I think one thing that you should take home from this is the amount of collaboration I think there is within the field, you know, amongst all these uh, great institutions that we're from. We really all talk to each other a lot, work together to try to make things better. Can everyone hear me okay? I know there are volume issues, so I'll try to talk loudly. But uh, what I'm going to be doing today is, is talking about a couple of um, pretty rare subsets of melanoma. These are melanomas that people don't even know exist sometimes. Melanomas from the eye or melanomas from the mucous membranes. These are really um, biologically distinct diseases from skin melanoma. They behave differently. They respond to treatment differently. Uh, we have to manage them differently. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit first about ocular and mucosal. So I talk about both a lot. I haven't been able to find a good way to unify it, so there's going to be an ocular part and then a uh, mucosal part. So in terms of ocular melanoma, um, you know, what is ocular melanoma? Well, these are melanomas that arise from the pigment cells, the melanocytes that live in the eye. Um, and, uh, you know, these are kind of the same pigment cells that you have in the skin that turn into to melanoma. Um, but the reason why they become melanoma in the eye is, is different. Um, there are a few different types of ocular melanoma, and the most common subtype is, is uveal melanoma. This makes up the vast majority of these ocular melanomas. Um, and the uveal tract, uh, let me see, is made up of three parts. One is this choroid plexus there, and this is kind of the middle layer of the eye between the white outer sclera and the inner retina of the eye. It's made up of the uh, ciliary body, which is this muscular ring that changes the shape of the lens and um, less commonly can come from the iris as well, which is the pigment part of the eye around the pupil. Um, less commonly, you can have melanoma coming from the conjunctiva, uh, and this is the, um, the, the mucosal layer, it's the thin layer of mucosa around the eye and under the, the eyelid, and this is if you get a conjunctivitis, that's the part that turns red in your eye. And that's, that's fairly uncommon, less than 5% of ocular melanomas. And they can also arise from the eyelid or from the orbit itself, and that's very uncommon. What I'm going to do for this talk, though, is really focus on uveal melanomas, because usually this is what we're talking about when you hear about eye melanoma. So uveal melanoma is the most common primary ocular melanoma in adults. Again, it represents about 5% of all melanomas, so this is maybe 2,500 or 3,000 cases a year in the United States. So this is very, very uncommon. And as I said before, this is biologically distinct from skin melanoma. The way we treat it is usually with either radiation or surgery, and so we can do an enucleation, which is just removal of the entire eye, but a lot of times we can get away with just some radiation therapy, uh, and that is very, very effective in controlling the primary site of disease. Um, but even if we do those, um, there's still a high risk for this disease spreading, and when it spreads, if it spreads, it's, it's actually very, very challenging to treat. Before 2010, um, this was really the list of FDA-approved drugs we had for melanoma, and you guys have heard about all of these before. You've heard about decarbazine and IL-2 and interferon, and certainly all of these drugs can help a small proportion of patients. Some of patients it can help well, but it certainly doesn't help most. Um, but then 2011 was a big year for us with the vemurafenib and ipilimumab, and you've heard a lot about some of these new drugs will, that will no doubt be approved in the near future. So the question is, um, how do these new drugs, which can work very, very well in skin melanoma, how does it work in eye melanoma? Um, and you just heard a lot about BRAF inhibition and vemurafenib, um, and you just heard that vemurafenib works very well if the tumor has a mutation in BRAF. Um, but the problem in ocular is that they, they rarely, if ever, will actually be driven by BRAF. And so this drug uh, is not one that we will commonly think about for uveal melanoma. But ipilimumab is a little bit different. And I didn't know if someone was going to show this slide before, so I put this in here. <laughs> it's kind of a classic ipilimumab slide now. This is a complicated one, but I, I think it's one worth going through because it just shows you um, kind of how we are actually manipulating the immune system with ipilimumab. It's, it's really complex, but let me just kind of walk you through it, and I, I don't think we're going to do tests afterwards, so it's okay. You don't have to. All right. So basically, ipilimumab functions by activating um, what we call the T cells, and you have good T cells in the body and bad T cells. Um, but ipilimumab functions to activate these good T cells. And for full activation of this T cell, you need this interaction between the T cell and something called an antigen-presenting cell. This is another immune cell that shows a piece of the tumor to the immune system. And for full activation, you need two signals. 
The first occurs when a piece of the tumor, which is this red thing there, is shown um, by the antigen-presenting cell to the T cell. And to use a car analogy that, that I think a lot of us use, this is kind of like putting the car in the ignition, or the keys in the ignition of a car. It's kind of getting things revved up. But for full activation, you need a second signal. And that's when this thing called B7 on the antigen presenting cell binds to CD28 on the T cell. And when that happens, you get full activation. And that's like uh, you know, pushing on the gas pedal. But what happens <coughs> once the T cell is activated is, oh, sorry about that, is this thing called CTLA4 migrates um, down to this area here, which is called the immunologic synapse. And it actually binds to B7. Um, and unlike here, when this binding occurs and the T cell is activated, this binding actually shuts down the T cell. Uh, and so this is kind of like the brakes on the immune system. What ipilimumab is, it's an antibody that binds to CTLA4 and it blocks this interaction. So that's how this drug works. And this is a huge advance for melanoma. So in, in uveal melanoma, Again, a lot of the data, the reason why this was approved was really based on work done primarily in cutaneous melanoma. And we know that, um, that uveal melanoma is really biologically a distinct disease. Um, and so the question is, does it be work in uveal melanoma as well? And there have been a few s small series um, published, and I think Dr. Mead has some more uh, information as well, perhaps, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, but at Memorial, we looked at a series of 20 patients that were treated with ipilimumab between 2008 and 2012, and these are just the patient characteristics that we, we saw. The median age was about 61. There were 11 males and 9 females. Um, most of the patients had had um, one prior therapy, um, and these patients um, had some high-risk features. A lot of them had liver disease, which is common in uveal melanoma. A few of them actually had brain metastases. Um, and here are the doses of the ipilimumab. Most of them had the uh, standard three milligrams per kilogram of, of ipilimumab. Um, we had um, a radiologist at our center look at all of the scans, and he was blinded by the results, so he didn't really know how the patients did. But he just looked at the scans and just very diligently plotted out how big the tumor sizes were. And this is, this is what we saw. Um, we looked at two different time points, at week 12 here and week 24 here. And this is a complicated um, plot called a spider plot. Um, so to read this, basically each line is a patient. Um, the x-axis there, this is time. Um, and then this y-axis is size of the tumors. And so if the line goes down, that means the tumor is shrinking over time. And so what we saw here is at 24 weeks, um, this one patient here in red actually had pretty good tumor shrinkage. And this patient met what we um, criteria for what we call a partial response, and they're just strict criteria as to what that is. And so we saw that, so uh, this one patient had a partial response at 24 weeks. Um, at, um, and this is a picture of his, this patient had a liver metastasis there, and this nodal uh, metastasis there, which shrank down nicely. Um, at 12 weeks, 40% of the patients had stable disease, and at 24 weeks, that was reduced to, to 20%. But interestingly, if you look at this one patient, you can see that um, his tumor kind of shrank and then grew a bit, um, but around week 50, he actually met criteria for a partial response. And so this is something that's common with these immunologic therapies, as I think you've heard a lot about, that sometimes we see these responses that are very late. It's not like with chemotherapy, where if it's going to work, it works right away. This can take a long time to work. And so even though um, this patient had stable disease at week 24, um, he actually met a, a partial response later on. And if you look overall at um, how many patients I think I would say benefited from treatment, um, at 12 weeks about 40% did, either they had shrinkage or stability, uh, and at 24 weeks it was about 25%. And I think this is similar to actually what we see with cutaneous melanoma. Um, there, there are ongoing prospective trials to really define um, the role of ipilimumab and the efficacy in this disease subset. Um, so I think there's more to come, but, but certainly for now, I think ipilimumab is a very reasonable treatment for this, either on study or preferably on study, but also off study. Um, on a molecular um, standpoint, we know that melanoma is really more than just one disease. Um, and a lot of the way we're thinking about it molecularly is we're dividing into different uh, mutational subsets. And we know that about 45% of melanomas harbor that BRAF mutation. Um, <clears throat> But there's this other piece of the pie where about 20% will, will harbor mutations in something called NRAS, and, and you just saw that MAP kinase pathway. 
I know the small percentage will have these kit mutations, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but about 4% of them will harbor mutations in something called GNAQ and GNA11. And this is almost all, um, almost all of those cases are uveal melanomas. And genetically, what we know about uveal melanoma is, is it's really different from, from skin melanoma. Skin melanoma is typically characterized by a lot of different mutations, um, whereas uveal melanoma is genetically fairly simple. And so the number of genetic mutations we find is actually very, very few. Um, and so in, in 2010, um, Bill Harbour, who's now in, in Miami, and um, Boris Bastian at UCSF found that um, really overall probably about probably about 70% of uveal melanoma was harbor a, a mutation in GNAQ and GNA11. Um, Bill Harbour later on showed that um, a proportion of um, uveal melanoma, particularly those that, that spread, the bad actors, um, have a mutation in something called BAP1, which is something that we call a tumor suppressor gene, um, and that leads to, to bad outcomes. And very, very recently, um, Bill Harbour uh, reported that there are recurring mutations in something called SF3B1, which is um, it's, it's, a comp it, it's a gene that encodes for this protein that's important for splicing these things called mRNAs. So this is important in kind of gene expression. Um, and so we think that all of these somehow play a role in, in the disease progression. And so um, I think you know a lot of us trying to study or find new treatments for this disease are trying to figure out. What are the implications of those mutations? What do those mutations do, and how can we take advantage of that to treat this disease? And so what I want to focus on is those GNAQ and GNA11 mutations for a little bit. And this is a really complex slide um, where this is a cell here. This is one of those seven transmembrane uh, receptors that Dr. Hu was talking about there. And these receptors, when they're activated, um, they signal through these growth pathways, like the MAP kinase pathway that you just heard about, or like the PI3 kinase AKT pathway here. And, okay, so this is another complex slide. GNAQ and GNA11 lead to uh, mutations of this thing here, which is something called G-alpha. And when it's mutated, it's always turned on, kind of like BRAF. It's very analogous to BRAF. And when it's always turned on, it's always signaling down this MAP kinase pathway. It's always signaling down this PI3 kinase AKT pathway leading to tumor growth and proliferation. Um, and so one idea is what if we shut down those pathways? Well, one idea is what if we just shut down G-alpha directly? And that's, that's hard to do. We can't do that yet. But we do have drugs that shut down um, things like protein kinase C, which is part of this pathway, um, MEK, which is part of this pathway, AKT, PI3 kinase, and mTOR. And this is... Um, kind of one, one direction that we're taking to try to fight this disease. Um, and our early work actually focused on MEK um, because we had some MEK inhibitors clinically available. And so what we did was we designed this trial where patients with metastatic uveal melanoma were randomized to either chemotherapy with temozolomide or um, a MEK inhibitor called AZD6244. It's just a pill that shuts off that protein called MEK. Um, and uh, in, in this trial, if patients received the chemotherapy, if their cancer grew, they could receive the MEK inhibitor later. Um, and this trial was a fairly large trial. This is just the biostatistical design, which, which I don't think we need to, to go into here. Um, and I, so we're actually going to be reporting the final results of the study in two weeks. Um, but, and I can't share that right now, but what I can share is some old data. Um, uh, showing some of the, the effects in terms of tumor shrinkage. And so this is from actually a while ago. Uh, and this is what's called a waterfall plot. You saw, saw some of these during the last presentation, where here each patient is represented by a bar. Um, and if the bar goes up, that means their tumor grew. If the bar goes down, that means the tumor shrunk. And, and you can see here that for the 18 patients who received chemotherapy here, almost all the patients had the tumor grow. Um, but this is what it looks like for the patients who got the MEK inhibitor. You can see that there's a pretty clear difference in tumor shrinkage, where we, we actually saw tumor shrinkage in most of the patients who were treated. Um, and if we look at um, the, the number of patients who actually got a, a resist response, those, those really stringent criteria for response, the response rate for chemotherapy was 0%, um, and for um, the MEK inhibitor, it was 20% at this point. Um, and we can talk about the mutations. I know you're looking at that, Pat. <laughs> um, you know, we did find a sh shrinkage in um, patients with both GNAQ and GNA11 mutations. Um, this patient here, actually, initially, we did not find a mutation. Um, and the reason why that was was 
Um, in, initially, we were just looking for the most common sites of mutation that affects a certain part of the gene, which is in exon 5. But it turns out that this patient actually has a mutation in exon 4, another part of that, um, that um, GNAQ gene. And so this patient actually is mutated. Now, that 20 percent response rate is, is a little bit modest, I guess, because you just saw all the Vemorafenib waterfall curves and all the Dabrafenib waterfall curves, and we're talking about response rates of 50 percent. Um, so this 20 percent certainly is not you know, dibrafenib, um, but I think it is meaningful when you look at um, um, patients treated on these other clinical trials of various chemotherapies and targeted agents for uveal melanoma, where if you pull these all, which is not really the right thing to do, but if you pull these all, you can see that only two patients out of 157 who were treated across all these trials actually had a response. So I do think that the MEK inhibition, um, while 20 percent I would like a higher response rate, is meaningful. Um, this is one patient who was treated on study who did have a GNA11 mutation, and at baseline, um, she had this intraorbital or this, this kind of orbital mass that was coming out from the eye. Um, small volume liver disease here, you can see that on CT scan, and this was pedavid, that's the cancer there. Um, and really, just within four weeks of therapy, you can see how much this shrunk down. The liver lesion um, shrunk as well, and it's no longer abnormal on the PET scan. And so the responses we see with this drug can be quite quick. Um, I put this up just to show, again, the collaboration that's needed to do trials like this in rare cancers. Um, to do this study, although, um, you know, our, our center led this one, um, it's taken 15 other sites to get this trial um, completed. Um, and, and, um, and there's a lot of interest across the country, really, in, in getting this stuff done. And Canada, this is a Canadian site. So what are our next steps? Well. You know, we're very interested in looking um, at, at blocking both pathways um, at the same time. And, and this is based on lab data that I'm not going to show you that shows that blocking the MAP kinase pathway and this pathway at different levels, whether it be MEK plus AKT or PKC plus PI3 kinase, or different uh, combinations are, are better than single agent treatment alone. Um, and so our follow-up trial, um, uh, which, which I, I hope to have open by the fall, is going to be randomizing 80 patients to um, trametinib, which is a MEK inhibitor made by GSK, another drug company, um, or trametinib plus an AKT inhibitor. Um, and so this trial, again, I hope to have open up by the fall. Uh, we're very, very excited about this study. Um, again, we're going to be doing this uh, in the U.S. with some of the sites that uh, we've been working with on the, the prior trial, and we're actually going to open this up internationally because um, yeah, as, as I think you'll, you'll be happy to hear, not only is there national collaboration on these trials, but also international collaboration. Um, and so we're going to be opening this up in probably three sites in the UK, uh, about six or seven sites uh, through the URTC in Europe as well. That way we can get the studies open, we can get them accrued and done faster. Let me see. Yeah, so there, there are a bunch of other drugs that are being developed that can target these various nodes of these pathways, and there, there are um, a, a number of upcoming trials that are going to be testing not just MEK plus AKT, um, but they're going to be looking at, at other targets, like this is a drug that targets something called PKC plus MEK and PI3 kinase and so forth. So there are a number of exciting trials that will be opened up in the near future for this disease. Um, and so, you know, this is a disease that just, you know, really f four years ago, three years ago was, was really challenging to, tr you know, very, it still is challenging, but um, very challenging, and I think um, the horizon's looking brighter. So in terms of summary for the uveal melanoma part, this is a distinct disease from cutaneous melanoma. It has a unique biology and a unique response pattern to various systemic therapies. Um, the currently available treatments for cutaneous melanoma have limited uh, efficacy, although, again, I do think that further investigation of ipilimumab as well as PD-1, PDL one and these other therapies is warranted and will happen. Um, emerging insights into the biology of uveal melanoma have led to the development of um, a series of clinical trials, which um, I think will, will have positive clinical impact for this disease. Um, and again, you know, obviously we do need your help to, to figure this stuff out. We can't do this without um, the help of patients and families. Okay, so for the rest of the time, I'm just going to totally switch over to mucosal melanoma, a completely different disease. Um, this is even rarer than, um, than, than uveal melanoma. There are about 2,000 cases a year in the United States. Um, 
And these are melanomas that, again, arise, arise from the mucosal surfaces of the body. So a bit more than half of these will arise from the head and neck area, and that's the mouth or the nasal passages or the sinuses in, in, in the head. About a quarter will, will arise from the anorectal region, um, and then about another 20% or so will arise from the vulva vaginal area. Um, as you can imagine, again, this is also a distinct disease from cutaneous melanoma. We think of melanoma as a, somehow related to UV radiation. These diseases aren't. This is different. Um, again, despite adequate surgery or, or control of the primary site, um, uh, unfortunately, patients do relapse a lot. The cancer comes back. Um, and in general, uh, this is a harder disease to treat, we think, than, than cutaneous melanoma. Um, in terms of comparing mucosal melanoma and cutaneous melanoma, again, uh, mucosal melanoma makes up just a small fraction of cutaneous melanomas. It tends to occur in patients who are a little bit older than patients with cutaneous melanoma. Uh, and it's more common in females, and that's, you know, of course, because of the, the uh, occurrence of this disease in the vulva vaginal area. Um, I think things to point out here is, you know, I think the, the key point here is that this does seem to be more aggressive. Um, and if we kind of match mucosal melanoma patients with cutaneous melanoma patients by stage, um, those with mucosal melanoma tend to have, unfortunately, they don't do as well. Um, because of that, people have tried to figure out, is there a way that we can uh, treat patients after surgery to re reduce the risk of this coming back? Um, and that's basically what interferon is used for for cutaneous melanoma. Um, last year, there was a study um, presented by uh, Jun Go's group. He's a, an oncologist in, um, in Beijing. Uh, and he conducted this very, very large and very impressive trial where he, he randomized about 189 patients to either observation or one of two treatment arms. Um, and this, as best as I know, is the only randomized trial to be done in this disease. So this is a huge accomplishment. Um, so group A was just observed, and this is really the standard of care. This is what we do in general for these patients. Group B received a year of interferon. And group C actually got chemotherapy, where they got um, six cycles of um, temozolomide, which is a chemotherapy pill, combined with cisplatin, which is just an IV chemotherapy. And the groups were pretty well balanced in terms of gender and age. You can see that about 45% of patients had head and neck mucosal melanoma. About a, about a third had anorectal melanoma, and a, a, another 25% or so had melanomas arising from the GU tract. Um, and you can see the treatment of the local uh, disease, whether it be excision or taking out the lymph nodes, was about equal within the groups. But the bottom line is this. When he looked at how long it took before the cancer came back, this was group A, which was observation. And in this group, um, it took about five and a half months before the cancer came back after surgery. So it was very, very short. For group B, which is the interferon group, it took about 9.4 months. And then for group C, it was over 20 months. So this was obviously extremely striking. And if you look at how long people live, and this is hard to talk about, obviously, but this is just what the data is. Um, for the patients who were treated with just observation alone, they lived for 21 months. If they were treated with interferon, they lived for 41 months. And if they were treated with uh, chemotherapy, they lived for, for nearly 50 months. So this was an extremely strikingly positive trial. Um, you know, but where does that leave you know, those of us figuring out what should we do with this data? Um, you know, obviously, if this were absolutely true, if we knew that was the case, we would do it. Uh, and I'm not saying that because I don't, you know, they, this was a great trial, this was a well-conducted trial, but um, this trial was also conducted just in a Chinese patient population. Uh, we know that their disease, their mucosal melanomas are genetically and biologically a bit different uh, than what occurs in Caucasian patients. Um, you know, so I think a lot of us are interested in seeing this trial reproduced. Uh, I don't know if it will be, because this is a very hard trial to do, but, um, but I think practically for those of us um, or those of you dealing with this situation. Um, this is a trial that I talk about with all of my patients, um, and, and certainly we, we, are, we are using chemotherapy in some patients. Um, you know, whether that's the right thing to do or not, I'm still not sure. But I think given this data, and this is all there is right now, I think it's, it's worth considering. So what happens when it spreads? Um, well, you know, we, we, we do systemic therapies, just like for cutaneous melanoma. And again, because of the rarity of this disease, there haven't been a lot of really prospective clinical trials just looking at mucosal melanoma. So um, work at MD Anderson 
um, has shown that biochemotherapy, which is where they combine chemotherapy with things like IL-2 and interferon, can work very, very well. And they've done a few um, retrospective series showing response rates on the 40 to 50 percent range. So you do get good tumor shrinkage with biochemotherapy. Um, and tumor shrinkage is good. Um, but what we really want is patients to live longer or, or cures. And that you can only um, that you can only figure out by a randomized trial, and that, that those trials have not been done in mucosal melanoma. Like we did with um, ocular melanoma, we asked the question, does uh, ipilimumab uh, work in, in mucosal melanoma? Um, and to get a reasonable size cohort of patients, of 33 patients, we worked together um, with the folks in Boston at Dana-Farber and Mass General, and Dr. Ott, who will be speaking later on, helped us out with this series. And so we identified 33 patients, the median age was 65. Uh, there was a slight female predominance. Um, and you can see that the majority of these patients had metastatic disease, so it spread from the primary site to elsewhere in the body. And you can see that the majority of patients got the standard three milligrams per kilogram ipilimumab dose. In terms of distribution um, site, about 40% arose from the head and neck, about a quarter from the anorectal region, about a third from the vulvovaginal region. Um, and we did look at mutation status, and you can see that a very small proportion um, had a BRAF mutation. There were a lot of NRAS mutants in this series, and about 16% had a kit mutation or amplification. And so this is just like, this is that spider plot like we saw for, for the ocular series. Um, and what we saw here was at 12 weeks, which is this time point here, uh, we had one patient who had a partial response to therapy and one patient who had actually a complete response to therapy. Um, and the patient who had the complete response was actually an 87-year-old uh, patient with a, a, what we think is a primary bladder uh, melanoma that had an NRAS mutation. Um, and this patient, um, you know, had, you know, certainly his response was quite durable. Uh, and the partial responder here was a 79-year-old patient with a melanoma rising from the sinonasal region. Um, no mutations were found. Um, and this patient, again, did well for, for quite a long period of time, but ultimately did pass away. Now, if you look, look at clinical benefit, and that is disease control or shrinkage, um, we saw that at 12 weeks, about a quarter of the patients had clinical benefit. But at, at 24 weeks, that percentage went down to 10 percent, um, which is a little, bit, uh, a little bit lower than what we would see for, for cutaneous melanoma. Um, you know, so I think the jury is still out about the efficacy of ipilimumab in this disease. Uh, certainly, this is not definitive. This is just a small series, but I think it's something that, that needs further work. Now, we're talking again about all these mutations. Um, and what we know is that the um, frequency of these BRAF and NRAS and KIT mutations is different depending on the type of melanoma we're talking about. And so you're, you're used to hearing that 45 percent of melanoma patients have BRAF mutations, but that's really only true in the, uh, the patients with melanomas arising from what we call non-chronically sun-damaged skin, and that's the common melanomas on the chest or the back or um, parts of the body that you're usually wearing clothes over. Um, if you look at NRAS in this subset, you have about 20 percent that have a mutation. But if you look at something called KIT, which is another um, important oncogene or cancer gene, you almost never find a mutation. Whereas if you look at the less common melanoma subtypes, like melanomas arising from sun-damaged skin, which is like on the head or the back of the hands, um, the mucosal melanomas or melanomas arising from the bottom of the foot or palms of the hands or under the fingernails, and what we find is that the incidence of these BRAF or NRAS mutations is less than here, um, but what we do find are, are kit mutations or alterations in a, a, a good subset of cases. So if you look at mucosal melanomas, uh, up to a quarter of them might have a kit mutation. Um, and it turns out that there are a series of drugs um, like um, dabrafenib or vemurafenib that instead of turning off BRAF, they turn off KIT. Um, and so um, doctors um, in, this is uh, Dr. Bastian and Jose Lutsky down in Miami and folks up in Boston, they, they treated um, some of these patients with KIT mutant melanoma with one of these drugs called imatinib, and they saw really dramatic effects. Um, uh, this is Dr. Lutsky's patient, a 69-year-old patient with a, a rectal melanoma uh, who had this KIT mutation here. Um, and this patient was on imatinib for four years, did really well for a long period of time, but then the cancer ultimately grew. Four years is pretty good for, for metastatic melanoma. It's not good enough, but it's pretty good. Um, and this patient in Boston was a 79-year-old female with metastatic rectal melanoma, had an uh, alteration of exon 11 of KIT. 
Um, and you can see here that just within a month, really, there's a complete normalization of some of these um, baseline abnormal lesions. And so to more formally um, assess the, the effects of kid inhibition in the subset of patients, we did a, um, a formal phase two trial where we took patients um, who we knew their tumors had a kit mutation or something called amplification, which is just when there's more of kit, and we treated them with imatinib. Um, and, and these are, this is a summary of the results, and this is another complex um, table, so I apologize for that. But here, um, this is a list of the 25 patients with the type of melanomas that they had. Uh, so there were mucosals and acrals and sun-damaged skin melanoma. These are the kit mutations that we found. And one thing that I think is striking here is the variety of mutations. Each of these are different, different mutations. This um, K642E is different from this V559C. It's different from this AA29P. And so this is a little bit different than BRAF, where almost all of the, a lot of the BRAFs are V600E. Um, and so in contrast to BRAF, where it's usually a, a homogenous mutation that we know responds well to drugs like femorafenib, this is a heterogeneous set of mutations that may or may not respond to some of the kit inhibitors that we have. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, each bar here represents a patient, um, and this is the duration of the time the patients have been on study. And they're color-coded by response. And so what we found was two of these patients here uh, achieved a complete response to therapy. Their whole tumor went away with the matinib. Um, these two patients here had uh, what we call a, a durable partial response to therapy. Um, and what was interesting is you actually didn't need a, a response to do really, really well. This patient here um, actually started imatinib in 2010, in April, and he's still on drug doing great. So that's about three years now. Um, and these two patients here with acral melanoma, although they did get really good responses, both of them started in 2009. Um, and interestingly, uh, this, this one patient here um, had a great response to therapy, and about a year ago, I. I actually resected the last bit of melanoma that was on his leg um, and took him off the imatinib. Um, he's like 90, 91, I think, at this point. So I thought maybe, maybe we can give him some time off. But actually, within a couple of months, it came back. So we put him back on the imatinib. And again, he's doing great, uh, cancer-free, as, as best as I can tell. Um, this is uh, one of the patients who had a great response to therapy. And this is a patient with the vaginal melanoma. So this thing here is actually the melanoma. And this is the pet abnormality there. And within six weeks, actually, you can see the major shrinkage there. And, and this is a patient who came into my clinic before we started with a lot of pain, a lot of vaginal bleeding. And that went away within a week of starting the drug. So the responses with this can be quite quick. Um, and this is a patient with uh, an acral melanoma. And all of these dark spots are the spots in melanoma. And you can see that within six weeks, um, there was improvement. By week 12, um, the PET scan was essentially normal, although on exam there were still some, some pigmented spots there that we biopsied. And um, I'm not a pathologist, but I'm told that there's no real melanoma there. Um, there's just some uh, melanin pigment there. So this, uh, this patient had a complete pathologic response to imatinib. So that was our trial. In our trial, um, we saw a median uh, progression-free survival time of three months. That is how long it controls a cancer for and a real response rate of 16%. Um, Jun Guo, this is the same doctor who did the adjuvant trial, um, treated 43 patients, found a progression-free survival period of 3.5 months and a response rate of about 23%. Um, and this is a group from Boston. Uh, the publication hopefully should be coming out soon. Um, and this is an early report, but overall they found a response rate of 25%. So again, if, if we're comparing this to vemorafenib, this is certainly not as good. Um, and I think that has to do with the mutation heterogeneity of the kit mutations. Um, and also, the, the duration of control isn't, um, you know, with vemorafenib, we'll see disease control for about six months. So this is, seems to be shorter than that. But what Dr. Guo showed is that, you know, if you did get benefit, either a response or stability, actually, that could last a long time. So that was a median of nine months. That's more on the order of, of what we see with vemorafenib. And there was also an improvement in survival. But one of the interesting things that he pointed out in his paper is that if you look at the patients who actually had a response, there were 10. Uh, one had amplification, but the other nine had mutations in certain parts of the kit gene, exons 11 and exons 13. Um, suggesting that maybe we can actually pick which of the mutations are the one that are going to benefit. Um, and so, 
you know, this is really a summary, uh, this is a little bit old, about a year old, but at that time this was a summary of all the published um, case series and studies of kid inhibition and melanoma, um, as well as the types of mutations that responded. And really all the responding mutations were exon 13 and 11. Um, and if you combine data from the, the Chinese trial, our trial, and the Boston trial, if you limit treatment to those with an exon 11 or 13 mutation, you actually get a 50 percent response rate. Um, and so maybe that's an easy way for us to better select um, patients to use this, this sort of treatment on. So I think, I think this is almost my last slide. Um, so mucosal melanoma, uh, in summary, kit inhibition is an effective therapy in a subset of melanomas with genetic alterations of kit. We do need identification of predictive biomarkers of response because, you know, we know it's not going to work in everyone. We want to know a priori who it's going to work on. Um, and uh, just like with the BRAF story, we have to identify mechanisms of primary and secondary resistance and uh, develop rational combination trials to kind of figure out how we can make this drug work better. And so from a molecular standpoint, again, you know, there are a lot of drugs that we're targeting for these specific mutations. Um, let me see. You know, and so again, this is the MEK inhibitor for GQG11 melanoma. There's a series of kit inhibitors for kit mutant melanoma. And then moving forward, I think our, our um, challenge will be to try to combine um, these target agents best with immunologic therapies to get the best of both worlds, where we can kind of get the rapid responses with targeted therapy and make them last for a long time, like with immunotherapy. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention.